Sure. Now, good afternoon, uh, and thank you all for coming to the final session of the first fourth strand of Gold International Arts Festival, winter part. We now have a winter um, section for the first thoughts, and we're very pleased with the response we've got from Galway uh, to these talks, both last night and today, and again, we see a lovely audience here before us. Now, um, our chair for this session has a voice that creeps into our sleepy heads every Saturday morning <laughs> to bring us brilliantly up to date with all of the important, peculiar, and funny events of the previous week. And what a voice Marion Richardson has. Soothing, ironic, mordant, and utterly trustworthy. <laughs> her capacity to structure her program perfectly, perhaps starting with the big political issue of the week, say Brexit, which we heard all about last night, followed by a quirky report on, say, the dolphin in the lift, which I'm sure she loved, followed by a piece on our endlessly fascinating history, followed by a hilarious um, section from Callan's Kicks, which is unmissable these days, isn't it? There's so many <laughs> hilarious people to, to imitate followed by a beautiful piece of music. All of this is calculated to make you feel you're in full possession of the week's events. What a lovely way to start the week. And I often have occasion to text her on a Saturday morning to say, oh, you genius, what a fantastic program yet again. So she is very valuable to us, a national treasure. She's also one of our most experienced broadcasters with a long career in reporting, presenting, and producing for radio and TV. She's also a committed feminist and the ideal person to moderate this session on the fascinating topic of women ministers <laughs> in politics, uh, focused on Martina Fitzgerald's much acclaimed book, Madam yeah. Politician. Yeah. Yeah. We're delighted also to have with us two former government ministers, members of a very select group, Maury Gagan Quinn and Janet Sullivan, who are here with us today. So please welcome Marion Richardson. <laughs> Much, Katrina, and um, it's it's lovely to be back in Galway, my old stomping ground where I spent many's the happy hour living on Nuns Island and then out west in Connemara. And it's also a great joy to share the stage with brave frontier women like Maura Gagan Quinn and Jana Sullivan, trailblazers in the world of politics. Maura, as you know, was of course the first female minister since Countess Markovic first female justice minister, and she's been slaying the dragons ever since, not only in God Erin, <laughs> but in Europe as well. Jan O'Sullivan, former mayor of Limerick, was one of Kemi's Femmies, and was first elected to the Dáil in 1998, 20 years ago. She served as Minister for Education and Skills, and before that she was a super junior, as they were called, and she survived the Labour election massacre in 2016. <laughs> Martina Fitzgerald is political correspondent with RT News and author of the bestseller, Madam Politician, which will be for sale later on. It's um, the story of the women at the table of Irish political power, and Martina, as Katrina says, it's widely acclaimed. Um, it's a terrific read and full of fascinating stories of how difficult it was not only to get into the Dáil, let alone get appointed to the Cabinet. How many women have actually been in Cabinet the last 100 years, say? 19. 19 women. And as you mentioned there, Countess Markovic, 1919. And Ireland was at the forefront in terms of appointing a woman a minister. And then we have to wait 60 years for Morrigan Quinn to walk through Charlie Hyde's door. And 1992, two women sit at the cabinet table together at the same time. An extraordinary event. And today, the record number is four. So, after your extensive research, what were the obstacles that they faced? What was it like in the old boys club? Well, I think if you go back to the 70s and 80s, you see a very different Ireland, and it wasn't very welcoming to women on the campaign trail, but particularly in the 70s. We all know about um, Mary Robinson's historic election in 1990 as president, but she failed twice to get elected to the Dáil, and once was in the late 70s, and once in 1981. And she was a mother at that time. And in 1981, her, her child, her youngest, was just one month old. And she would recall how she, how she would have to find safe houses to breastfeed, it's which is a given today. Yeah. And also that voters, men and women, which is surprising, would say, you should be at home minding your child. Mm. And Maura, when you were first elected for Fianna Fáil 
It was in a by-election in 1975. It was after the death of your father, Johnny. And you weren't very interested in politics at the time. You may have been interested in politics, but you certainly weren't interested in pursuing a political career. You had a, not a really, young be, child. Not really, because I was in, uh, I had taught in Dublin for three years, and then a new school was built in Renmore in Galway City, and uh, I wanted to come to Galway, and we were getting married that year in 73. So we moved down, and I became a member of the local common in Renmore, and was pretty active in it and all of that. But it was when my father got his first heart attack that I really got very active, because for several months afterwards, he couldn't do clinics, he couldn't uh, you know, look after constituency work or any of that, and between my mother and myself, we helped uh, to do that for him. And then he had another heart attack, and then finally he had a fatal heart attack in 75. And uh, after he died, some uh, maybe three weeks, two or three weeks after he died, uh, the doorbell rang at home one day, and I answered the door, and these three or four men <clears throat> that I knew were senior people in the organisation, Galway West, were outside, and they said they wanted to talk to my mother. So they came in, and they were in the front room with my mother, as you did in those days, <laughs> and uh, I was sent off to make the tea and bring in the sandwiches <laughs> and all that, and I brought it in, and when I went in, uh, they said, you know, we'd like you to sit down. And uh, so I sat down and uh, they said, you know, we've decided that it would be a good thing if we could get a member of the family to stand and we feel that you are the one who has been very active with your father and all of that and we'd like you to be the candidate. And uh, I think they kind of expected me to say yes. And then I said, well, you know, I said, I got married in 73. I had a baby last year. Uh, you know, he's very young, so I'll have to discuss this with my husband. And John, as he always did all through my career, when I went home and we talked about it, uh, he said, well, you know, you only ever get asked to do these things once in a lifetime, and another opportunity could never, probably would never come again. So he said, whatever you want to do, I'll be there. And I went for the uh, by-election convention, and I had five councillors who opposed me at the convention, <laughs> and we went through every single one of the ballots, and eventually it was a straight ballot between myself and... Michael O'Flaherty from Carrow Row, and I happened to win. Not by a lot, but I did. And that was kind of the first, that, that uh, you know, kind of battle to get the, the, the nomination was the first battle, because exactly as Martina says in her book, you know, I went around to the uh, constituency delegates. The, that time, every common had three delegates to the convention. And I would go in and they'd say, well, now, you know, your father was a great man. And, you know, he was always available seven days a week and all the rest. And now here you are coming. You're very young. You're a woman. You're a mother. You have a baby. You're like, you won't be able to do that. And I said, well, I'll never be as good as my father in people's eyes. I'll do things differently. But I can guarantee you that six days of the week, I'll give my attention to politics. Sunday will be my day off. And... Um, Eventually, you know, it all happened and I got elected and all the rest of it. And we'll come back to you being elected and getting into power. Jan, going back to your early days in politics and your time in local government, your mentor was Jim Kemi, mm -hmm. um, Democratic Socialist Party, before you joined Labour. You were one of Kemi's femmies. What did that <laughs> involve? <laughs> not of interest. <laughs> it's kind of a self-descriptive title, I suppose. Um, but it wasn't particularly a compliment in those days. Being a femi or a feminist was not the <laughs> most popular or profitable thing to be uh, back in the Limerick. And Limerick was a fairly conservative city in those days. Uh, so we were really fighting against the trend, but um, I had gone to Canada, I'd actually had my first child in Canada, and had come back to Limerick, and uh, before I'd gone to Canada, we'd been involved in um, campaigning for a family planning clinic, because of course the whole contraceptive issue was, was you know, a real problem in those days. This is back in the early 80s, and um, so Jim had been kind of a stalwart in campaigning for the family planning clinic, constantly in trouble with the church, constantly in trouble with the city fathers, with everybody really in Limerick, but very popular at the same time, you know, with the, with the grassroots of Limerick City. Uh, people who didn't agree with him at all on some of the, those kind of feminist issues, but he was a stonemason, he was, you know, the heart of the city and so on. So um, I saw Jim from afar. I, I was involved in a group called, I think it was called Limerick Feminist Collective. There were a lot of feminist lot of collectives. collectives. <laughs> and uh, we did things like, we campaigned for equal pay for equal work, which is interesting now when we're yeah. talking about the gender pay gap, but that was the battle in those days. 
Uh, and then there was the, the issue about the family planning clinic, etc. And uh, so we were kind of, we were very strappy, you know, we were, you know, we were really a bunch of women trying to change the system and change the world overnight. And Jim was such a hero for us because he was a feminist. Uh, you know, he didn't care if he broke the rules. He didn't care if he annoyed people. So, uh, so I wanted to get involved. I offered, to, I wanted to campaign for him. Uh, so eventually, uh, he was an independent at that time, but then he established the Democratic Socialist Party and I became one of the founder members. And uh, we were founded in 1982, which was the, the year before the abortion referendum. So my first baptism of fire in politics was knocking on people's doors, asking them to not vote for the referendum in 1983, which uh, was uh, you know, very, very different than the most recent campaign which, you know, while it had its moments, was an awful lot more respectful of people of all kinds of views. And I see Hildegard there, who would have been on the Oireachtas Committee with me, actually. And, uh, you know, people listened to each other in the most recent campaign. But in those days, it mm. was very difficult. Mm. So anyway, um, Jim founded the Democratic Socialist Party, and the local elections were coming up in 1985. And um, I had been saying all along, oh, there aren't enough women in politics, there should be more women in politics. So it was put to me, well, you have an awful lot of talk about this, would you consider standing? So I ran in the local elections in 1985 and I was elected and I've pretty much been a public representative ever since. Just to go back to you, Maura, um, you were, as we said, the first woman appointed to the cabinet since Countess Markovic. And you have a great story about the Taoiseach Charlie Hockey <laughs> calling you into his office. And you'd voted for George Colley yes. in the leadership contest. So what do you think was going to happen? Curtains. Well, definitely we thought it was curtains. And John drove me to Dublin and we were on the way up in the car and I was explaining to him that, you know, I wasn't going to be, um, I was going to have more time at home now because I had been <laughs> a, a junior minister as it happened. You know, I was a junior minister at the time. And uh, we were, anyway, uh, driving up to Dublin. And about maybe leak slip, because you used to have to go through leak slip in those days. Uh, John said, well, now, let's think about one thing. Supposing he says to you that he wants you to be in the cabinet, what are you going to say? And I laughed. And I said, well, not in a million years, I said. And he said, well, just think about it. What would you say? And I said, well, I couldn't do it. I possibly, couldn't possibly do it. <laughs> Cormac was just born uh, in uh, July. And um, this was, you know, the November. And uh, John said, well, I said to you when you were going for election that you only get asked once and the opportunity might never come again, so think about it. So anyway, I arrive up to the fifth floor where uh, Charlie Hawhey's office was and the Fianna Fáil offices were, and in the room, the, uh, outside the waiting room, mm -hmm. where all the guys that the papers had tipped were going to be fired. And I said, <laughs> well, I'm in the right place. <laughs> <I'll> start. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I went in and he was sitting at a beautiful table with the most fabulous silver tea service <laughs> on a silver tray on, on the table and his feet up on the desk. And I'd never seen that before or since, but he had, he was very relaxed. And uh, I sat down anyway and he said, um, well, Maura, you know, it's a big day. It'll be a big day tomorrow and all of that. And he said, I, I think he said that you and I are going to make history. And it didn't dawn on me, you know, and I said, what do you mean we're going to make history? And he said, uh, oh, he said, I'm going to appoint you to the cabinet. And as Martina rightly says in the book, I will always regret what I said. Mm. I said, do you think I'm good enough? Yeah. It was the most, it was the worst statement I ever made. And I made plenty of them in my career, <laughs> my career. but that was the worst. And he got mad. And he said, do you think that I would have asked you, he said, or said that I was going to appoint you if I didn't think you were good enough? And I walked out the door, and as I was going out, he said, you can only tell John, you can't tell anybody else. And I walked out with a big, long face, and I came down to where all my <laughs> pals were, and the pals were all saying, like, what's the news, what's the news? I said, we're gone, we're gone. And then, of course, the following day, yeah. it was all announced. And, um, John, you also said that you wouldn't have gone into the Dáil if your children had been in primary school. Um, how important were domestic considerations? Yeah, I think they're an important consideration for, certainly for women, but they should be for men as well. But, you know, things are changing now. But for me at that time, um, it was 98 when I was elected to the Dáil. It was by election after Jim Kemi died. I had run twice for election with him in general elections and I hadn't got elected, but he had. But I'd been in the Shannon from 92 to 97 and Jim sadly died and uh, I was elected in the by-election. So by that time, my children were... 
um, in, my daughter was in college and my son was in secondary school. So um, I felt at that stage that, you know, I could, I, I could go to Dublin. I mean, everybody, I suppose people are aware that you basically go to Dublin on Tuesday morning from your constituency. If you're in the cabinet, you go on Monday evening. So while I was in the cabinet, I would have gone, gone to Dublin on Monday evening and come back generally on Thursday evening if you're a TD, but if you're a minister, you probably have to go traipsing around somewhere else mm. at the weekend as well. So it's very demanding. Mm. And um, <clears throat> I honestly don't think I would have done it um, if they were in national school because, um, you know, you need a hugely supportive system at home. Um, I'm, on, I'm one of two children. Um, I don't have a whole lot of relatives. Um, I don't have any sisters. My mother was living out the country. I was living in the city, so it wouldn't have been practical for her to get involved. So um, I, I genuinely don't think I would have, you know, because no. I think you do have to balance and family think... life with, uh, with politics. Uh, and you can't give all of your attention to one or the other. You actually do have to do the balancing. Now, women are brilliant at that kind of balancing, but you do make those kind of decisions. And do you think that would pay to your leadership in, in ten? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if I... I mean, I stood for the deputy leadership of the party. I didn't mm. ever stand for the leadership. And again, I think that was a consideration. I don't mm. think I would have been willing to give the time that a party leader needs to give mm. to being constantly in the seat of power, which is mm. Dublin, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I honestly don't think I would have, you know, and um, I mean, I admire women who have, who are willing to give their all to politics. I think quite honestly for me, I've never been willing to give my all to politics. And I mean, I, Maura saying her Sundays were her Sundays. Mm. Um, for me, my Sundays generally are my Sundays as well. And um, I mean, family, is important, I think, to all of us. Mm -hmm. And um, I certainly wouldn't have sacrificed the opportunity to give as much time as I could to, to my family. Whereas when I did go to Dublin, you know, as I say, my daughter was in college in Dublin. Uh, my son was in second, second level school. Um, you know, caused a little bit of trouble here and there, but it wasn't too bad. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, so I could do it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I actually love it in, in lots of ways, but I mean, it is still a huge juggling experience. And I think that's probably why one of the reasons, I mean, I think it was Ivana Batchik identified five C's or someone yeah. identified the five C's. Mm -hmm. um, what is it? Cash, child culture, childcare, um, confidence, yeah. and what's the fifth one? I thought there were only four. I think there are five. five. <laughs> I forget what the fifth one is. But, you know, I think they're all considerations. They're really genuine considerations well, for now. women in terms yeah. of politics. Yeah. Martina, to get back to you, there was enough sexism in the doll for you to write an entire chapter on it. Tell us the story <laughs> about... Um, Gemma Hussey. This is the story that seems to have landed on three, uh, the front pages of three newspapers and has taken her almost 40 years to tell the story publicly and she was very courageous in doing that. Um, first of all, Gemma Hussey in the late 70s and early 80s uh, was very, a very strong woman. She was campaigning on women's rights uh, and at the time she was campaigning for rape within marriage to be a criminal offence, which seems absolutely ludicrous now, but that's what she was campaigning for. And she had a private member's bill. And she was a senator, she went over to the Dáil, and there are facilities for senators uh, to sit around the chamber and overlook proceedings, and that's where she was sitting. And suddenly, uh, she gets a tug at her bra strap, and she jumps up, she looks around, and lo and behold, who does she see? Uh, the leader of Fianna Fáil and the Taoiseach of the day, Charlie Hawhey. And he continues speaking to her and says, don't worry about your bill. I have a very good minister, Sean Doherty, to look after it. And he continues talking on and she is just flummoxed. And I think it's really important to say she was a leader of the Women's Political Association. She was not a shrinking violet mm. and she was rendered speechless. And it was just one of many incidents that she in particular uh, experienced. There was another incident at a, a teacher's conference where a teacher who was drunk came up to her and groped her, groped her, touched her breasts. And she uh, had to go up to her room that evening. The officials came up afterwards and they apologised on his behalf, but he didn't. So a lot of women have come forward now who were in the doll and have given their stories. Another minister, a former minister for education, Eve Brannock, she was in the doll chamber and uh, an opposition uh, or a TD came up to her and asked her to help her to help him out with a constituency matter. A normal enough event, 
but what happened wasn't. She wasn't able to help him, so he pushed her and uh, she uh, hit her head against a painting behind her and she thought she had cracked the Malton painting and she was worried about that. But afterwards, what is different compared to her and Gemma Hussey is that the next day, Neve Brannock did tell someone the story of what happened. And you know what that person said? I think it's really sad. She said, don't worry, he won't remember it because he had drink on him. So they were more concerned about him than her, and she had a number of incidents. And Gemma Hussey would also say that she had uh, another female politician confide in her that she, this, this woman, who we don't know who it was, was the subject of a serious grope in a lift in Leinster House. And Gemma Hussey, as only Gemma Hussey could say, was by a holy Joe, who was a hypocrite, who was against everything. But that woman had been subjected to this in the lift and it had yet again gone unreported. But there are various levels of sexism. Mm. Some have been subjected to very crude comments like Mary Mitchell O'Connor, mm. and that is in recent times. She won't repeat what was said because it's mm. so crude. Mm. But I do think there is a realisation that things are changing. Well, Brian Callan also asked Eamon Gilmore to try and rein in Joan Burton when she was interrupting. I mean, it's that level of it too, isn't it? Many of the comments that have been made in the Dáil have been called out for what they are. And that you mentioned one, uh, he was Taoiseach at the time, Brian County asked the, the, the Labour leader to rein in Joan Burton. Now, would he have said that about a male colleague? Now, he did apologise. We've also had very famous other public comments, and of course, that's women for you. Yeah. Uh, Albert Reynolds uh, responding to heckling from Nora Owen. Yeah. Now, Nora Owen states to me that he was not sexist and she was sad that it was Albert Reynolds because yeah. he was the type who would open the door for you with that as well. and he was, he was very generous but she yeah. thought the remark was sexist and I can't let it go without mentioning Pork Flynn's comments about oh. Mary Robinson. Mm -hmm. Her newfound interest in her family yeah. and her children which he remarked upon during the 1990 presidential campaign and that helped her campaign but it also had an immediate effect on the ground and Mary O'Rourke, who was campaigning for her brother, Brian Lenehan, she felt he had turned a corner and was en route for a success, which she said instantly in Westmeath, there was a reaction on the doorsteps to that, that afternoon when she went out. And Neve Brannock, who was up in Dublin campaigning for Mary Robinson, said so many women came after that interview on, on, on a Saturday View, so many women came out uh, that afternoon in Blackrock, they, she had to send them to Monkstown and to, to other parts that there was such a reaction against it. So they have been called out. But there is sexism with a small s, and I think many women will relate to it, because I think this is a political book in one sense, but it's a social one. It's about women in the workplace. Mm. And Frances Fitzgerald, while she was in Cabinet, she would point out that she would make a point and a, a, an idea, and it would be discussed. And when it came back, it would always be credited or referenced to a male politician at the Cabinet table, and that you had to be not only assertive, but over assertive. And Catherine Sapone says that is the story. Well, that's I've experienced reality. that as well, um, where you would say something at Cabinet and uh, some male colleague would agree with you or, you know, say something about it. And then another male down the other end of the table would invariably refer mm. to what the man said rather than the woman who had actually initiated the idea or the conversation. Mm. It, that's very, mm. very common. But I'd say it's common in, in, in a general life as well. Um, Maura, you were the first minister, a uh, female minister for justice. Um, I'm interested in how you negotiated power in such a male-dominated area. And you also had a very interesting encounter or exchange with the, the Garda Commissioner. I did, yeah. I mean, <coughs> when I, I had no idea what to expect when I became a minister. And I was very lucky at the Cabinet table. I was sitting beside John Wilson, who had, been, who had worked in the Barna area in my by-election, and we had become great friends. And, you know, he helped me because nobody, in those days when you went into Leinster House, it was this huge big building. It was like a rabbit warm, warm <coughs> with corridors and small little offices. Nobody took you aside and said, this is where the post is. This is where you go if you want to get paperwork done. This is where your secretary is. Nobody did that. I think they do now, but they didn't do it in those days. So you had to <coughs> find your own way around. And he was kind of the person who did that with me and for me. And I always remember we had the first discussion on a budget in, of all places, Barrettstown, because the Taoiseach, Charlie, decided that we didn't want to be disturbed by phone calls and all that kind of stuff, and therefore we'd go out of the government buildings and have our first meeting there. 
And John Wilson was beside me. And you see, every minister at the time of budget, as Jan knows, is absolutely fighting for their own portfolio. You don't give a damn about anybody else's because if you lift your head and you support somebody else, immediately the Minister for Finance will jump in and say, well, that's fine now, Maura. We'll give that money, we'll take that money out of your budget and give it to him. So John Wilson was beside me and I could see the figures and he had at the top the demand from the department. <coughs> Middle was what they could live with and down at the bottom was what the Department of Finance wanted. And this discussion took place between himself and George Colley. And it was very tough and, and you know, a lot of uh, words were spoken and all the rest of it. And he never mentioned what uh, the figure was that the department could accept. He kept on talking about the top figure. And eventually, anyway, an agreement was reached and all the rest of it. And when that was over, I said to him, I said, John, you never mentioned the, the figure that the department could live with. You never do that, he said. You always go for the top and you'll be lucky that you'll find somewhere in between. So that was the first lesson I learned as a minister. Secondly, uh, you know, talking, going, going around, the, I suppose in the first four months that I was minister, I had to make a decision with Udras and Gaeltakta that three of their factories, where jobs were costing in those years something like 7,000 um, per job, when the equivalent in the IDA was costing about two and a half or 3,000. So basically the Department of Finance said, we can't live with this and we don't have the money for it, so a decision will have to be made. So the board made a decision that these would get uh, 18 months to either break even or be in profit. And in the event that they weren't either in profit or had broken even, they'd have to be closed down. Two of them were in my constituency. Seaplast in, in uh, Spiddle and Contec in Carrow and the decision was announced. And the following Saturday, uh, I'm inside in the kitchen having come back from my clinic and Ruri comes in. He was probably, I suppose he was maybe five at the time. And he comes in bawling his head out. And he said, Mammy, he said, why do they all hate you so much? And I said, what do you mean, Ruri? And he said, they're all outside. They're shouting and screaming and saying bad things about you. And they were. The workers, the union had organised, it was the same union in both places, had organised that they would come to the home. And that's one of the reasons, Marion, why all of my life in politics and since, I've always said there is a step beyond which you should not go. And I don't care who the minister is or who the TD is, their home is off limits. You can go to their clinic, you can go to a function that they're at, you can go to their department or whatever, but their home should be and must be, I think, off limits. So you asked me about... I was asking you about your time oh, as yes. Justice Minister when... Justice Minister. When yeah. there was one um, rep guard the representative <laughs> who um, didn't know the rules and shouted at you. Yes. Um, How did you deal with that one? Well, the biggest thing that happened when I was Minister for Justice was uh, Gay Mitchell was the Fine Gael uh, spokesperson at the time and every single morning in the doll on the order business he would get up and attack me and he would keep telling Albert Reynolds you should never have put anybody other than a Dubliner into the Department of Justice because they don't understand what crime is all about. <laughs> so eventually as Hildegard will know well when somebody keeps hammering at you like that you have to stand up and do something. So I'm coming home from the department I'm about 10 o'clock at night I'm leaving the department and I'm coming out and I'm getting into the car and suddenly I said, you know, I said, I want to go down. I want to go to St. Teresa's Gardens and Fatima Mansions. I want to see what Gay Mitchell is talking about. So the, in those days, the, the Minister for Justice had a driver, an armed driver, and then had two armed um, detectives in a car behind. So they stood up and said, no, you're not, we're not bringing two cars down the, those streets. We'll go in this car. It's an, an unmarked car and they'll just think it's three cops. So anyway, we went down and we went all the way around, in and out of all the little streets and everything, saw everything that was going on. And then I said, the driver said, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go to Store Street. That was the, the guard station at the time. So down we went to Store Street and uh, one of the detectives came out with me and we were walking up the steps and there was a whole queue of, you know, um, so-called criminals in front of me. <laughs> but I, about five directly in front of me were prostitutes who had been elect erected arrested on the street, <laughs> right? <laughs> arrested, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> so, anyway, he said, we'll, we'll, get, we'll go in front of them, we'll skip the queue. And I said, no, I'm going to be an ordinary citizen tonight. So, <laughs> and I go, so there was a, a 
the poor guard, the God love him, was on duty and he was checking their names. But he wasn't looking up. He was just saying, your name. And they were giving the name and then they were being shuffled off wherever. And it, I came up then, you see, and he said, your name? And I said, Maury Gagan Quinn. And he said, I said your name. <laughs> and I said, Maury Gagan Quinn. And he left the pen down and he went to jump up and he said, for fuck. For. <laughs> then he said, he said, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> And I said, no, I said, it's not Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's just me. And uh, th he said to me then, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'd like to have a look around if that's possible. So if there's a sergeant on duty, maybe you might call him. And to this day, I always give credit uh, to Frank Moore. He was the sergeant on duty and he came up. And you'd imagine it was in the middle of the day with nobody around and that he had got about three months notice that the minister was coming. And he welcomed me, he said, you're very welcome, come in. And we did a tour of the station. We sat down and had a cup of tea afterwards in the canteen. And I said to, he said, do you want to ask me anything? And I said, yeah. I said, Frank, if you had my job tomorrow morning, what would be the first piece of legislation that you would introduce? introduce? And he said, public order. And it became the first piece. And I gave him credit in the Dáil for it because he was the one who had explained, you know, in all of the cities in those days, you know, gangs of young fellas would gather with their bottles of cider and so on in sort of corner sites beside houses where very often there were maybe an elderly couple living and, you know, they were there till all hours of the morning and the Gardaí couldn't do anything about it because there was no law. So that became more law, if you like. Mm -hmm. But that was it. And then the following morning, I went into my office. And I mean, and I, I hadn't told a sinner other than the two detectives who came with me about the trip. So I'm inside of my office and the next thing, my good, strong Kerry man of a Secretary General strolls in. And he said, well, Minister, I hear you went walkabout last night. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I did. I said, God, the news gets out very quickly. Well, I had an interesting phone call from Garda headquarters, he said this morning. And I said, did you? And he said, yes, he said. The commissioner at the time, Mar Martina doesn't name, but it was Paddy Culligan, everybody would know from the year. <laughs> Uh, rang and he said, um, Secretary, he said, uh, you know, the minister, he said, was out last night and walk about down in all the places and she called into Store Street and this is not acceptable. He said, I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day organization of the force. She's responsible for being in her office, answering questions in the doll and delivering legislation. <laughs> and he said, I want you to tell her, he said, this is not acceptable. I won't stand for it and it can't happen again. And the Secretary General, who knew me pretty well at that stage, said, well, you know now, Paddy, he said, I'll definitely deliver the message, but I can tell you now, he said, there will be an answer with two words, and the second will be off. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine how popular I was with the Commissioner afterwards. <laughs> Jan, you're, you're quoted in Martina's book, and you're saying that from time to time there are men who get to Cabinet when there are women who aren't in cabinet who would be better. <laughs> yes. Do you have anybody in mind? <laughs> oh, that would be telling, wouldn't it? But there are, I mean, there are loads of very average men who get elected to the Dáil who get, you know, get into cabinet. Maybe they're a little bit more than average to get into the cabinet. But, I mean, there are lots of women, and right now in the, in the Dáil as well, who would make perfectly good uh, government ministers. But, I mean, it, things are changing now. In fairness, things are changing, um, but not quickly enough, but certainly in the past, I mean, when I went up there first, there were very few ministers, mm. and there were lots of very good women at that time. Like, I mean, I'm thinking of back maybe further with people like Nuala Fennell and Monica Barnes, those kind of women mm. who were real feminists at the time, um, who didn't ever get to cabinet. Um, and it just seems like men can, I, I don't know whether it's they know all the right people or they're in the right situations or whatever, but they seem to get to, a, a lot of men seem to get to a situation where they're actually considered to be senior enough that the next step is to get into cabinet. Whereas it doesn't happen as much, uh, I think, with women. Now, we're, obviously, we're a much smaller number in there anyway. Um, but, I mean, there are women now, I mean, look at, you know, Joseva Madigan, for example, is the most recent one. Um, who, you know, maybe we didn't have the opportunity to build our way up, and maybe that is the real story, that it, the, the old traditions of the man being there from early on, working his way up through the commons mm -hmm. and through the organisation, mm -hmm. and uh, then getting on the council and then, you know, working their way up for us, for women. <coughs> um, it is that culture thing. We haven't had that, mm -hmm. you know, that tradition of being involved 
Uh, and I think people have said that if you didn't have quotas, and I'm a great fan of quotas, that um, it would take us, I don't know how many yeah. hundred years to actually get to parity. We'll get on to quotas later, but I'm just to continue this theme of how women are perceived in the Leinster House bear pit. You've another chapter on appearances, Martina, and you detail some pretty ugly um, instances like um, Sheila de Valera having to cope with remarks about her weight. Um, and there was the recent thing, Mary Mitchell O'Connor being referred to as Miss Piggy by Mick Wallace. You know, how important did, did you think it was for women to look the part? Many women will tell you it's part of the job. They see mm. it, whether it was Mary Robinson while she was president or Mary McAleese, you had to just sort this out, be done with it, but it was part of the job. But I do think there is an enduring focus on women in public life and their appearance mm. and that their male colleagues do not get the same scrutiny. And just to be clear, Sheila de Valera has said, nor should they, and I would agree with that. But she in particular came under some horrendous commentary. Uh, for instance, once uh, a journalist wrote resolutions for famous people and under uh, Sheila de Valera was to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think there are many male colleagues who would get that kind of, of remarks, nor should they. Mm -hmm. She also had a cartoon of her that really amplified her weight in a, in a newspaper. Now, she does point out that the editor spoke to her about it afterwards, and he said they had never got such a terrible reaction to anything he'd ever published, and rightly so. Mm. Um, so there is that problem. Mary Hannafin once went to the Panto at Christmas, normal enough. The punchline was a joke about Mary Harney's weight. Mary Harney was out of politics at this stage. So Mary Hannafin rang the panto the next day and said, that's not, that's out of order. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have said that about a man. And they did take it out. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you look <clears throat> today, Frances Fitzgerald made the headlines once for the most unusual reason. What was her crime? She wore the same outfit two days in a row. Tisk, yeah. tisk, standard <laughs> swap. <laughs> Would anyone notice notice bar maybe Mick Wallace if they wore the same outfit the same <laughs> shirt and tie and suit yeah. two days in a row no. and Mary Hannafin had a picture taken of her but from the back and her picture was put in the newspaper and the the caption was can you guess who this is so uh, I don't think um, men come under that kind of scrutiny and you wouldn't like them to come under but that do you think scrutiny. Mick Wallace has done women a favor by dressing the way he does all those little pink <laughs> t-shirts <laughs> no I don't actually I'm one of those and I'm probably in the minority that just thinks that what he, the way he dresses in the doll is totally unacceptable. And we owe, we owe actually that to a Cian Corla called uh, John O'Connell, because Tony Gregory was elected to the doll and Tony opted not to wear a, a tie, uh, but he always wore a jacket mm. and a, a nice shirt and all of that. But there was a, a row in the doll about it, and basically they said, uh, you know, you have to wear a, a shirt and tie. And the Cian Corla said no. Tony decides he's not going to wear a tie, so we're not going to have that. Now, that was one thing, but the way I think that Mick Wallace has taken it way, way past that, and I think there is a certain decorum when you are uh, a, a public representative uh, and you represent people in the constituency and you represent people when you go abroad and all of that, and I think there is a way that you have to, to look. But going back to the dress thing, when I used to go on television, and I'm sure Hildegard will say it's exactly the same, I would do what I thought was a great interview on prime time or today, tonight. And I would come back to Galway the following week and I'd do my clinic in Richardson's and then I'd be walking down, not looking at anybody in particular because I had things in my head, a list of shopping that I had to do. And several people would come up and say, God, Maura, you were great on television the other night. And I was trained in communications by two people, Tom Savage and Terry Prohm. And Terry always said, if somebody says to you that you were great on television, your answer is, thank you very much. Now, what was I talking about? What exactly did I say <laughs> that you liked? So yeah. I would do this. Yeah. And invariably, everybody said, oh, sure, I didn't know what you were talking about. What your hair was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> that pink jacket that you had on was fabulous or whatever. So, and I'm not sure that that has changed very much mm -hmm. since. You know? And as Martina rightly says, if a fellow goes on, all he has to do is change his tie. Mm. And it's a different outfit. Well, I remember Dick Spring being on television one time with a white polo neck and everybody commented <laughs> on that. So maybe, you know, maybe it sometimes works other ways. But I, I remember talking to a woman at an international event and saying, 
thank God for Angela mm. Merkel because she oh, just yes. wore a black That's pair right. of trousers yeah. in the winter yes. and a light coloured pair of trousers in the summer yes. and a different colour jacket yeah. but all the same, more yeah. or less the same shape all the time. And it, this woman said it has liberated us. You know, yeah. we, we don't have to be thinking about mm. what we wear if we don't want to. Obviously, on the other hand, you know, if you want to express yourself through what mm -hmm. you wear, by all means, I think you should feel free to do that as well. But uh, I thought that was interesting um, yeah. because she was such a powerful woman and still is that, uh, you know, yeah. she set a kind of a pattern that women could feel free to follow. Yeah. Martina, you wanted to get in there? There is also the flip side that many of the women in the book also say it's, it is an asset, their appearance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that they were the IKEA colours, the reds, the whites, the blues. blues yeah. And I know as a TV journalist, you are going to stand out more if you wear those colours. And Mary Hannafin, your former colleague, would point out that she had a very specific strategy on big occasions and it was a three-pronged strategy wear green because it shows her republican leanings wear a local designer and make sure it's a female designer so that was louise kennedy mm -hmm. uh, but women are very aware also mm -hmm. that in a sea of men in gray suits that if you're wearing the bright colors and mm -hmm. i know hildegard is wearing a bright color today <laughs> that you will get more noticed yeah and you will get more co coverage however there is a line and many people have crossed that line and sometimes it is people in the media and sometimes I think some of the politicians, including some of the panel have said it, is, it was female uh, journalists in the past. Well, Maura, you had an experience with a female journalist who liked to comment on the length of your hair. Every <laughs> single Sunday for months, for years, she commented on my hair and from the time I was elected first and she would say, it would only be a little piece but she'd say, and Maura Gagan Quinn still hasn't cut her hair. <laughs> or look at the age she is now, it's time for her to cut the hair. It went on for ages and ages and ages. And then in the middle of an election in 87, I actually went to my hairdresser and I said, Maureen, I want you to cut my hair. And she said, oh God, I couldn't do that. And I said, because I was able to sit on it almost. That's it. <laughs> and she did. And for the whole election campaign and the constituents, everybody, did you see Maura's new hair? You know, <laughs> it was, it was gas. Your woman never made a comment on it when I had when I had cut <laughs> But wasn't there also some committee that sat to discuss that? Yes, we had a women's rights committee and I was chair and Monica Barnes was vice chair. Of course, Charlie tried to be the chair until I explained to him politely <laughs> that That's this would not be appropriate. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we had that kind of a relationship. But anyway, Monica was vice chair and I was chair. And there was a big thing at the time about, you know, the, the washing machine, the person getting things whiter than you could ever get it. And it was always a woman and very often she was scantily dressed or they were selling a car and there was a scantily dressed woman, you know, draped on the bonnet of the car, whatever. And this went on, particularly in the Sunday world, I have to say, but in other newspapers as well. So Monica and I discussed with the committee members what we should do about it because we said the portrayal of women in the media was wrong and it was kind of perpetuating this view of what women's role was. So we decided we would invite the editors of all of the national newspapers to come and see the committee. So we sent out a very nice letter inviting them all. And they all came with the exception of the culprit himself, Colin McClelland. Who shall he be was, nameless. He was, yeah, yeah. He was the editor of the Sunday World at the time. But he made a fatal error. He wrote a letter basically telling us where to get off that it was none of our business, that he was the editor and he would decide what, was what would be pr appropriate for his newspaper and what wouldn't be. And that uh, he was infinitely, he found it infinitely more pleasing to see a woman scantily dressed, draped over the bonnet of a car, than a man fully dressed, sitting behind the wheel or whatever. Something to that effect. So anyway, we met all the other editors and they were all, they all came in, they were very respectful and they were all very anxious to point out that they didn't go down this road. So anyway, when it came to producing the report, we said, well, now, what are we going to do? We just make a comment to say that the editor of the Sunday World said he wouldn't come, refused to come or whatever. And then Monica and myself went for a cup of coffee in the Doyle Bar, of all places. And <laughs> Another no-go area. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, we were chatting about it and we were saying, like, we need to give it a bit of publicity because nobody had known about it at the time. So anyway, I don't know, was it Monica or I that said, well, he, nowhere in the letter are the words private and confidential. So let's give it to the... <laughs> solicitor that's looking after the committee and I ask him if there is anything that prevents us from actually publishing the letter as part of the report and there wasn't and we did and he went ballistic <laughs> but there was nothing he could do but it was a great solution <laughs> did you ever wonder why you gave up your nice job as a teacher to go into politics 
I did because teaching was lovely at the time, you know, you were finished at, mm. I was finished at half two in the day and I had the rest of the day to myself, prepare a bit for the next day and all my weekends off and all of that. And several times when things would be tough, as I'm sure, Jan, you found in politics too, you'd say to yourself, what am I doing? You know, why am I putting myself through all this stress? And I think the stress in politics is felt more <coughs> during my time by women than it ever is by men. And the other thing, if you're a mother, and I think you suffer from guilt from the minute you leave the house on a Tuesday morning till you come back on a Thursday night. And I remember Cormac was out with the babysitter one day and she had forgotten to lock the, the, um, the pram or the go-car. And when she was coming down off the footpath, it snapped and his finger was in and it took the top off his finger. And uh, he went to the hospital and he spent, I don't know how many hours in the hospital and there was no, you know, uh, cues or anything like that at the time, but he spent, I think it was 10 hours before it was seen to. And John didn't tell me about it until the following day. And I felt so bad about that because I had in this thing in my head that if I had been at home, it wouldn't have happened. Of course, it would have happened. Of course it wouldn't. You know, mm. those kind of things you can. Mm. But women suffer from that guilt, I think, all the time. Mm. No matter what arrangements you have at home, no matter whether your parents are helping out, your mother or your mother-in-law in my case, um, you still have that thing that you're leaving your children and people might say to you, well, why the hell are you doing it so? Why don't you stay at home and mind mm. your kids? Mm because I think you get driven, you get into it, and it is like a drug. Mm -hmm. I found it like that, that you, 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 know, you were always doing it, no matter how many things went against you. You know, when I was Minister for uh, Transport and Communications, I went to Aer Lingus, and uh, Martina has this in the book as well, and um, uh, I went out to meet the board because things were very bad financially in the company at the time. Uh, we were very concerned that the board was not mm -hmm. actually behaving as a board should, that they weren't tough enough on the administrative team and all of that. So I went out and I told it as it was at the board, to the full board, and I came back in. And the media reported that night that I had gone out and I had handbagged to the board. And uh, the following day I was in the Doyle and um, Austin Curry and Alan Jukes were in talking about Aer Lingus and what was happening and could I explain and all the rest of it. And that morning before I went over to the Dáil, the, my secretary in the department said, you know, you're going to have to put out some kind of a statement about the handbagging because that can't be allowed to go. So I said, you know, I said I won't because I think, I said, there'll be somebody on the opposition benches that won't be able to stay quiet and they'll have to use the word handbagging. So I waited, waited, and Austin Curry got up, fair play to him. <laughs> and he said, and you went out yesterday and you handbagged the board of Aer Lingus. And I jumped up to my feet and I said to the Count Corla, the great Sean Tracy from Tipperary, I said, a Count Corla, if a man went out to a state board and spoke tough and gave the facts, he would be admired as being strong and yeah. all of the other adjectives. But because it was a woman that went out, she's accused of handbagging. And I believe, you can call it, that that word is an unparliamentary word and should not be used. And he stood up straight away in his beautiful English. He said, I absolutely agree with the minister. <laughs> and afterwards, we came out, you know, and after question time in the doll, sometimes you'll go down to the bar for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. And Alan Jukes came in and he... We were great friends because we were Gael Gores. And uh, he sat up on a high stool beside me and he said, I saw the wheels in your head. He said, going around. <laughs> as soon as Austin Curry, he said, opened his mouth, I said, you're dead. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. You know, so yeah. there are funny moments too, yeah. you know. Yeah. Not yeah. that funny though. <laughs> <laughs> Martina, as political correspondent with RT, you're in and out of RT, you're in and out of RT but you're also <laughs> in and out of Leinster House. Is there any sense now of, of a sisterhood there? Or do party, does it go along party lines still? Well, I think there, there are changes. Firstly, there are more women in, in, mm. in the Ulster mm. House. We have a record number. A 2016 brought over 30 for the first time, 35. So that's mm. firstly a change. And that obviously has an impact on the atmosphere. But in terms of sisterhood, yes, there's a women's caucus has been set up. And yes, they're coming together. Not all of the parties are members of mm. that because party allegiances have in the past and to the present day trumped the mm. sisterhood. Mm. And that's, that's the harsh reality. Although there have been instances where women 
have shown, you know, uh, I suppose, uh, collegiality to women in other parts. Yeah. Uh, but Neve Braddock, I should say, mm. never thought she got it from yourself, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> at the cabinet table in 1992, she said it broke down on party lines mm. and that she was at the close to the exit door because she was the last in. She yeah. was the runt of the of the of the the cabinet, and Maura was up at the top beside mm. Albert from a different party, and that's how it broke down. Mm. So you would like to think things have changed in terms mm. of numbers they have, mm. and there are certainly attempts to bring women together and to highlight issues, including sexism, and they're campaigning for an mm. audit mm. and a code of conduct. So that's for all positive. But will it trump party allegiances? I don't know. Mm. There's also an awful lot of serious work being done. I mean, can you just talk us through that kind of kind of legislation that's been introduced since Mora was in, in government. Mora introduced, of course, the decriminalisation of mm. enacted the decriminalisation of homosexuality. I'll try and say that again. Mm -hmm. um, that must have been very difficult at the time. Did you get an awful lot of opposition from from your party colleagues? Start with those. Well. It started because we had put a, a programme for government together with Labour and it was part of the items on it. But there was never any pressure after we went into the mm. government that this had to be done now. I went into the department and they, as Jan will know and has experienced, they'll give you a long list of all the legislation that's coming up and they'll say these are the priorities and these are not the priorities. And the decriminalisation was way down at the end of the list. And I said, why is that at the end of the list? Remember at the time, the case had been taken by David Norris in Ireland, then he had gone to Europe with Mary Robinson. So the likelihood was that we were going to be chased up about it again. And the department said, well, we've put it down on the end because we think it's a very difficult issue for anybody to handle. So I said, well, you know, all my life, and I think for most women, you'll do the most difficult thing first and you leave the easier things mm -hmm. afterwards because they get done very quickly. So I said, I think we should... Do it. So I met the gay and lesbian uh, organisations, they came in to see me. They had had a party the night that the new government was formed and they had one guy stood up when my name was called out as Minister for Justice and he said we're F-U-C-K-E-D. That was, mm -hmm. they were his words because he felt that I was right wing and conservative and all the rest of it and Fianna Fáil and therefore it wouldn't happen. So anyway, I um, told them in the department to start working on a piece of legislation and I went into Albert and I said to him that I, I wanted to bring this piece of legislation and I said I know it'll have no hope of passing if I don't get your support at the table. I knew I'd get the support of the Labour Party and Charlie McCreevy for example would have been a great supporter and um, so Albert said, well, you know, he said, um, I would be regarded as right wing and I'm a very strong Catholic and all the rest of it. And I have great difficulty with these kind of issues. But he said, if you're telling me, he said, that this is the right thing to do, then I'm prepared, he said, to support it, which I think was a great thing for him to say. So um, anyway, we prepared the legislation. Um, I met the, the gay and lesbian rights community and I think everybody has seen Phil Moore on television mm. in recent mm. times. She was at the end of the table and I kept, my eye kept going to her because she was much older than all of the other people. And I was wondering all the time, what's she doing here? And she told the lovely story, which she told on television, which was, she said, uh, Minister, my uh, son uh, came home to me um, so many years ago and uh, I was in the kitchen and he said, Mom, I have something to tell you. And he told me he was gay and she said I was going to bring him to the doctors and it's all right it's a phase and you'll grow out of it and you know she said I did all the usual things that everybody did and at the end she said I realized this was him and we had to accept or not accept and of course she said, put my arms around him and told him I'd love him I knew it was going to be difficult but I would support him and she said and you tell me she said that he's a criminal and they were probably and I think I said it to Martina the most powerful words that anybody said to me in my political career and so I came out absolutely convinced we were doing the right thing. So the legislation came up and I went in to the Fianna Fáil Parliamentary Party meeting. And I was, I had a reputation in Fianna Fáil as being very outspoken. You wouldn't believe it now. <laughs> and crossing swords with a lot of the, you know, people, powerful men in the party and so on. But I always spoke my mind, you know, I didn't believe that you should go out from the party meeting and start talking about things outside. I felt if you had to say them, say them in the room and or say them privately to whoever you want to have a go at. So anyway, I went in and you presented your bill up at the top table and Albert was sitting beside me and um, then the floor was open for questions and all of that. And uh, there were several questions by, and there were a number of TDs who would be reasonably well known, who had you know, grave reservations and basically were saying like, this is not something that far more important things that we should be doing rather than this. 
So anyway, when it came to the wrap up at the end, I thought about what Phil Moore had said to me and I looked around the room and I said, I'm looking around the room here, I said, and I see the vast majority of people that are here are parents. Most of you have sons and daughters and I just want you to put yourself in a position where when the son or daughter are 17, 18 or older, come in one evening to the kitchen and say, mom or dad, I have something to tell you. And they tell you they're gay. And I said, think about what your reaction is going to be. You've loved them for all these years. You're so proud of them and supportive of them. And suddenly they say something that you're not particularly happy about. What do you do? And I think that that made people who were very anti the legislation really think that it could happen to them. And if it did, what would they do? So they weren't prepared to go against it. And uh, on radio, I think the discussions I had on radio were tougher than anything I had in Fianna Fáil because there was a very big, strong group of the right wing organisations who got together and basically took me on on all of the programmes. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't even listen to what you were saying. They weren't interested. This was just against God's law. It was, you know, all the stuff that you read about what, what they think about homosexuality. But at the end of the day, I think uh, people in the party and in other parties uh, were very happy with what was done. Gay Mitchell tried to uh, put in um, an amendment which said that you'd have one age for um, homosexuality and a different age for heterosexuality. I mean, it was ridiculous, and I told him it was ridiculous. <laughs> and when we were, when Martina's book was being written, uh, Gemma Hussey came up to me and Francis sister and said they were mortified and they couldn't stop him. He was just determined that he was going to do this, but it didn't go anywhere. And there was great support. And then what happened, and I'm sorry for talking so long, the no, following Saturday, after Mary Robinson signed the bill into law, I'm in my clinic in number one air square, which is on the corner. And the next thing, I hear music outside, but if you're living in Galway, you always hear music. So I didn't pass much heed, and it got louder and louder and louder, and then there were somebody, you know, like, not, not shouting, but kind of um, saying something out loud or kind of preaching or something like that. And the next thing, Tim Richardson, the boss, came upstairs and he said, um, Maura, I think you better go downstairs. He said, them boys and girls of yours are outside on the street and they're blocking the entrance to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> And I can say that now because Tim, God rest him, is up there yeah. somewhere. And uh, so I came downstairs anyway, and there was a massive group of gay and lesbians who had come from all over the country. They had uh, engaged the local brass band. They started at Bohemore. They started at Bohemore, and they marched down, and then they gathered, and they were singing my name and shouting my name and all of this whole and they had uh, a bouquet of flowers to present oh. to me. And I thought that was the loveliest That's thing lovely. ever because I hadn't organised it, you know, no, they had organised it themselves because it meant that much to them. A good day's work. But isn't that great? I mean, that yeah. is about the telling of the stories. You know, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Who told you yes, her story. Yes, yeah. And it's become so much easier now in Ireland for people That's to tell their it stories. Is, it is. And the marriage referendum was another yeah, example yeah, of that, yeah. you know, where it was the stories about yeah. my son or my <laughs> yes. sister or whoever yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, and in a way, you know, again, the stories were told in the most rec recent referendum as well. Yes. And I think in Ireland, in the past, you know, people kept all these things inside. They were afraid of shaming their family mm -hmm. or whatever it mm -hmm. was. Whereas now we talk about things. Yes. And I think that's one of the biggest changes yeah. in mm -hmm. Irish society. And, you know, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, women, political women yes. have been at the heart of a lot of these mm -hmm. conversations. Mm -hmm. So, Maura, just one last question to you. There's never been a female minister for finance or a female teacher. You might have been both if you'd hung around. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, um, the government... Um, or that we had all those difficulties in 1994 and it just came too early I think I mean I had been so busy in the Department of Justice and there was so much to do as anybody who's been in that mm. department knows uh, there's always a crisis of one kind or another and I was absolutely you know focused on that and it goes back to what Jan said it's easier for men they go to the bar they go to the pubs they uh, have kind of like, it's not as if there's a clique, but there are a group of them that kind of surround each other and support each other and all of that. And it became obvious to me the night before the vote that, I mean, Bertie was so far ahead, there was just no point. And the party was feeling kind of broken in a way because the public honestly believed that 
both myself and the Taoiseach and all the ministers in the cabinet, both Labour and Fianna Fáil, knew about Father Brendan Smith. Nobody did, but you couldn't tell people that at the time. They just didn't believe it. And for me, if I walked down the street here, I always felt people were looking at me saying, oh, she knew all about that and she did nothing about it. And so the party was very broken up because of that. And I kind of made the decision in the morning, I wasn't going to win, but if we had a vote, it was going to be a split in the party. It might only be a small split, but it was still going to be a split. So what to do? And I decided that I would allow myself to be proposed and seconded. And once the nominations were closed, I would then get up and say that I wasn't going to contest. And so I, I'm not sure. I think <coughs> Jan said there that, uh, you know, you have to be willing to give every single part of yourself if you're leader of a party. I think it's very difficult. I think if you watch Joan Burton and Mary Harney and the kind of challenges that they faced when they were leader of the party, uh, I think it just shows you have to have nothing else on your mind, nothing else on your plate, only just that clear view of what you have to do as a leader and all the people that you're responsible for as a leader of the party. And I'm not sure now, looking back on it, whether it would have been for me, and I think it was a much better decision not to be. Before I open up questions to the floor, Martina, um, how long do you think we, it'll be before we have a woman Taoiseach? Well, <laughs> <laughs> most of the women in the book are not very hopeful, not in their lifetime, oh. because you have a young leader of Fine Gael, and also party dynamics matter in Fianna Fáil, and most in Fianna Fáil that I, that I asked believe the party isn't ready for it yet. And by the way, we've never had a female Minister for Defence either, and never, never had a, a female Minister for Foreign Affairs, Finance you also mentioned. We've never had a woman even contest the leadership of Fine Gael. So there are still so many glass ceilings, mm -hmm. and also there's a feeling that some of the departments that the women go to, there's a stereotyping involved, mm -hmm. that they go to education or to health, uh, or to, to social protection. Mm -hmm. Although we do have a Minister for Business, we had a Minister for, and several Ministers mm -hmm. for Justice. Mm -hmm. But there are still some areas and some glass ceilings to be smashed yet, mm -hmm. and not everyone is hopeful that that will be soon in terms of the leadership ones at mm -hmm. least. So, the reason why we're here, Madam Politician, <laughs> um, would anyone like to ask a question of our guests? <laughs> we have a man down there. Uh, thank you. The, the um, people that you didn't interview for the book, people who have passed on, I think maybe Eileen Desmond might be yes. one. I'm not sure if there's any more. So I just wonder, could Jan and Mar, if they knew Eileen, just uh, mm. give us some memories? And the second thing is that um, whatever you think about Brexit, the, uh, from a human point of view, what Theresa May has gone through in the UK and relation to members of her own party like Boris Johnson, and Jacob Rees Moggs. Uh, I wonder would it be the same if it was a man? So thank you. I th in relation to the second question, I think it would be done if it was a man. I think John Major suffered exactly the same way that Theresa May is suffering now. He wasn't doing a Brexit, but I think he followed um, uh, a woman uh, as a, um, Prime Minister who had been very strong and uh, very tough on members of the party. And he came in, he's a totally different kind of person and kind of personality. And he was blown apart by the 1922 committee and by a lot of those whose heads have now been raised in the whole discussion on Brexit. I feel sorry for Theresa May in a way. On the other hand, I feel very annoyed with David Cameron because mm -hmm. I think he called a referendum and then didn't mobilize the pro-EU people in the UK. And if there's one thing you do when you have a referendum, you choose, like there's an, a, an automotive industry in the UK that gets enormous funding from the European Union in areas of research, for example. There's a pharmaceutical um, part of industry in the UK that gets huge uh, support from Europe. And all of the third level education institutions do exceptionally well in Europe. None of them were mobilized by the government. So they literally decided on a referendum, I think, decided, sure, it's going to get, you know, it's going to be beaten. Uh, nothing is going to happen with it. And suddenly they're landed with this mess. And she was a remainer. And now she has to carry the can uh, for all of this. And I think, even though I have no inside information, but I just feel that at the moment in the UK, the Conservative Party is unmanageable. 
And I'm very disappointed with Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party because I think there was an ideal opportunity for them to come forward and say, look, this is what we have in Europe. This is what we're going to have if we leave. We believe, even though we think there's lots of things wrong with Europe, but we believe that you should stay. The first question, Eileen Desmond was the only one that I knew. And uh, Eileen was there during part of my time. And uh, she was, again, tough, labour to the core, uh, fought um, you know, for rights for people, did a fantastic job, I believe, as a minister at the time. Uh, but I wasn't particularly close to her. I was very close to Monica Barnes, and I was also very close to Nora Owen. I think Nora Owen, because we were both ministers for justice, we both understood what was going on and the difficulties. And Monica Barnes, because she was just an all-round good egg. We were on the Women's Rights Committee together. We had so much fun, but we did terrific work. And I hope that we supported each other. You know, because of that, we had a great closeness. So... You know, for people to think that you're not close to people on the other side of the aisle is not true. There are great friendships that go right across the political parties. I mean, there were a group of us who were all Gael Gorey, that I said, and we'd meet, not regularly, but, you know, you'd meet between votes or at votes or something like that, and you'd be chatting away in Irish, and somebody would go by, of course, and make a, a nasty remark about the Gael Gores are out again, you know. But, um, no, Eileen Desmond I would have had a lot of time for. Yeah, I, will. I didn't know Eileen Desmond very well either because there was a bit of an age difference mm. and the party I was in, the Democratic Socialist Party, we actually merged with the Labour Party in 1990, so I'm only in the Labour Party since 1990. But I remember Eileen telling one story, which I suppose shows how far we've come, uh, about she could be out all over County Cork and she'd come back with all the issues and so on. They didn't even have a secretary in those days mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a TD yeah. I mean, in the yeah. ministry, I presume she did. But she'd have to come back and handwrite letters. She could go back home at midnight and start handwriting letters in relation to the issues that had come up. So, you know, it was really, really tough mm -hmm. in those days. Mm -hmm. I mean, things are much easier now. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really know her personally, but she was kind of straight down the line, left wing, heart of the Labour yes. Party yes. kind of woman. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's a pity that she wasn't able to feature in the book. And Countess Markovic is the only other one, I think. Well, I was never going to get to her. You were never going to get to her. Even you couldn't get to her. <laughs> and just briefly on the Theresa May thing, I think there is a little bit of the, the woman thing there because those guys are such kind of caricatures of, of mm, any mm. man even. You know, I mean, uh, those two in particular, Boris Johnson and, and Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, so I, I do think there is a little bit of that because they're so condescending in, in so many ways that I, I think the fact that she's a woman is a bit of a factor and maybe I disagree with more on that. Um, and just on the Brexit generally, I mean, I think it just shows what a, what a pity there wasn't some kind of proper discussion on the issue before they actually voted, yeah. which says an awful lot about public discourse in the United yeah. Kingdom. Yeah. And I'm also disappointed in Jeremy Corbyn mm. um, as a Labour Party person. I mean, we would have close contacts with people in the British Labour Party. Brendan Howland in particular would have been over there quite a lot and talking to the various uh, people in the British Labour Party. Stella Creasy is a woman I've met a number of times and she would be strongly a, a Remainer. Um, but uh, Obviously, Jeremy is an old-fashioned, left-wing, anti-European person in his own right. And even though the people around him would want a, a different position, I think, from the British Labour Party, obviously, a lot of their votes came from constituencies where there was this basic, don't have these foreigners coming in, taking our jobs kind of attitude. Um, but I think there is debate going on now in the British Labour Party. And... I hope that their, that debate is in somewhat influencing their position. It's interesting to talk to them about how there is gradually becoming more of a feeling of, you know, that there should be a second referendum. Um, but obviously it hasn't, it hasn't actually taken, the, it's not the, the um, official position of the British Labour Party, but it's certainly something that we are trying to influence in the context that we, in the context that we have within the British Labour Party. But it is disappointing. Both of those parties, um, in a way, have let down their own citizens, and, and that's very sad. It's also very sad, obviously, for us because oh. of the consequences yeah. for Ireland. Oh. Any other questions? We have a, a gentleman here with the blue shirt. Could I ask for your views on gender quotas? Um, and not only gender quotas in the context of elections um, or getting into the doyle, but gender equality or gender representation on committees, including the cabinet. 
Well, I was one of those who was, uh, like a lot of the, well, not a lot, but like several of the women who were there in my time against gender quotas on the basis that I believed in meritocracy and getting there on your own steam and all the rest of it. Um, I was in a slightly different position to most people because even though I had a tough convention to get selected, I still had a name uh, that, was, that had recognition, a bit like Mary Lenahan, Mary O'Rourke. Mm -hmm. But um, now I strongly believe in the gender quotas. And I think as well as the gender quotas, the really important decision that was brought in was to tie it to the financial contribution mm. to the political party. Mm. I don't think it would have made any difference if you just brought in a quota. I think you had to actually tie it to financial contribution. When I did the um, gender equality report for the Higher Education Authority, which was dealing with universities and institutes of technology, we had a similar discussion to what went on in the Dáil about what do you do when you have so many women up to a certain level at a university and then suddenly they're blocked and men get all the jobs above that. And that was the, the reason that we brought in the gender quota, uh, quotas, and, but we also tied it to the funding that universities get from the Higher Education Authority. So I think both things together are very helpful and I would be totally supportive. And I think they have to remain until we get to a level that we're happy with. Once we get to a level that we're happy <coughs> with and we're there for a while, well then maybe you can start to make different changes. Uh, as regards, what was the second part of the question there? Oh, gender uh, representation. Gender representation on committees. on committees. Well, of course, there is a rule um, that the government have and that the European Union have. And it started, I think, at 30% and went to 40%. In Europe, in research and innovation, which was the area that I knew best, we decided that there would have to be a 50% representation all the way up from the committees that look at the proposals to the committees that make decisions on the proposals to the proposals themselves and where you had two proposals that got the same mark at the end of the day the one that had the gender equality on its board was the one that would get the funding anyone else but not a yeah. cabinet Oh, not there a cabinet. No, I know. Well, yeah, just cabinet is... Yeah, yeah, very yeah, briefly, just yeah. to respond to um, um, I have been in favour of gender quotas since the start of my political career. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important to point out that what it is about is basically giving people choice. I mean, it's mm. not saying you have to vote for a woman, but it's giving people choice. And it has definitely made a difference in yes. terms of mm -hmm. the most mm -hmm. recent yeah. election, um, you know, where the 30%, uh, the parties have struggled, but they've, they've done oh. it because they were going to be hit in their pockets. And I think we did it within our own party as well. So within the organisational structures of the party, there have to be a certain percentage of both genders on our national organisational bodies mm. uh, and our subcommittees and so on. And that actually works well within the culture of the party as well. Um, so I'd be in favour of it, you know, right, right, right. Martina? Now. Can I say, interestingly, while most of the women are for gender quotas now that I interviewed, they're not when it comes to cabinet. It's actually the two former presidents mm. and people also um, like Gemma Hussey and Joan Burton who are for, for cabinet. So that's interesting. And also when I was in about promoting this book, um, a male presenter asked me on a local radio station, many men are worried now that some women who uh, have not earned their stripes and who may not be strong enough are getting promotions. Uh, and many men have these concerns. How do you feel about that? And I said, have you ever asked a man that question or of a man that question because I'm sure there were duds <laughs> on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone else? A man over there? It's all men. <laughs> yes, there's, there's no, could we ever quote it's it here? Raining men. <laughs> uh, yeah, my question is on our system of elections in terms of constituencies and do you believe that the current format supports an increase in sort of say the caliber of candidates that get elected. Um, so for me, I'm from Galway East, and when I go into the last four elections and I see the caliber, I see the faces on the paper, I don't know half of them, and I do keep up with uh, politics, but uh, they're just almost anonymous, but I would be aware of candidates that might want to vote for in another constituency, but I'm barred. So would you see that if we sort of took half our candidates for the doll? I made it on a national platform that might improve our gender quota because like I can't vote for Jan unless I move to Limerick, Limerick yeah. but I might want to vote for and it is a national parliament so do you think maybe our style of elections which is very local based in terms of we're all vote, voting locally that whether that is something that we should look at in terms of 
changing it to improve the diversity of our politicians? I hated proportional representation when I was a TD. And the reason I hated it was because during every election and between elections, I fought with my own party colleagues. I never fought with the opposition. And at election time, uh, you were always fighting for your own seat because it was a five seat constituency. So we usually had four and sometimes five candidates going for two seats or three seats if we were lucky. And where did those seats come from? You targeted, or certainly I was targeted, I would have to say, maybe because I was a woman, I'm not sure, uh, that you go for the soft target. Who might lose their seat? Whose seat could I take? And that was kind of the basis on which um, uh, the PR system worked. Um, first past the post is very, when you see what has happened in the UK, it's very difficult and very strange too. Um, and having this list system, which they have in a lot of European countries for the European elections, for example, they have a list system. I lived in, Brus in Brussels, in Belgium, and they have a list system. On a list system, what happens is that the people that are better known, the people who have, you know, like Giver Hofstad and people like that, are always at the top of the list. They now have a system where they have to have X number of women and they have to come in sort of like a man, a woman, a man, a woman kind of thing. Um, I'm not so sure, it's not that I don't want to answer the question, but I'm not so sure how it would operate here. I think maybe we could test it in a European election contest, context and see how that works out. But people in West Galway have an ideal opportunity. You vote for Hildegard Nocton. <laughs> <laughs> He's in East Galway. Yeah. He's in East Galway and he has a Fianna Fáil candidate there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, I suppose because I come from a, a smaller political party, I, I like the, the mm -hmm. multi-seat proportional representation. Like in my constituency, we have four TDs, all from four different mm. um, parties. So at least, you know, whatever your political perspective is, you have a good chance that you have a representative who in some way represents your views. So uh, in a way, I think that's good. I mean, I don't like the first past the post, you know, your safe conservative, your safe Labour seat, where you'll never be, if, you, if you're a Labour person in the conservative area or a conservative person in the Labour seat, Labour area, safe Labour area, you'll never be represented in Parliament, you know, by your local um, MP. So I, I think that's the worst of all worlds. I think there are benefits in the list system because it, it does mean that um, people vote more, maybe, rather than the person who gets to the medical card or fixes the hole in the road, they're actually voting for political reasons, you know, for ideological reasons. And maybe we, we don't have enough of that in Ireland. We're not particularly ideological in our politics in Ireland. Obviously, the two big parties would be, if you like, centrist parties, though so you might disagree with me, mm -hmm. but I mean, by and large, they are centrist yeah. parties. Whereas in other countries, you have much more of, the, of a left-right divide and people think a bit more ideologically. Whereas here, I think in politics, we tend to think more locally, more, um, I don't know, um, kind of the person, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. or the person. I yeah. mean, I, I don't like, I, I think it's good in one way that we have to know exactly what's going on. We have to hold clinics and we, we know, you know, from talking to our neighbours yeah. what the issues are and we get a real experience of them. We're not in an ivory tower in Ireland, that's for sure. But on the other hand then, you do have to spend a good bit of your time doing the, the clinic work. Um, and, and, you know, maybe you should be spending more, particularly when you're a minister mm -hmm. actually, and you do find that people who become ministers sometimes find it very, very hard to actually retain yeah, their yeah, seat yeah. because they're fighting against the, the other public rep in the area who doesn't maybe have any much mm. national responsibilities, hardly ever speaks in the doll in some cases, but does all the local stuff. And that'll be the one that'll get mm. the higher vote, you know. So there, there's benefits and, and but negatives, I think. But I, by and large, I think our own system isn't too bad. And I don't think it's going to change no. for the no. medium term because mm. every attempt to try to change yeah. it has been strongly rejected by, yeah. the, by the Irish people. Mm. We've time for one last question. Any takers? A woman. <laughs> we need a quota here. We have Alice at the back. Alice Lee. Sorry, I, I would just uh, like to say, isn't, isn't it very serious that young people aren't coming out and voting? I mean, they did come out of the two referenda 
all right, but the last election figures were down again. So how do you see, how can we involve young people? Should there be something in the area of education to, to stimulate interest in politics? Well, maybe, could I say just on that, I actually did start the process of introducing politics uh, as, as a subject uh, when I was Minister yeah. for Education, and that's moved on now, yeah. which I think is a good thing. Um, but, and I think the other thing is really just to, to make space for them. Um, again, if I can just talk about my own experience, we've recently selected our local election candidates in Limerick, and we have a young 25-year-old young man and uh, a woman in her 30s running. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I, there is a huge interest in politics yeah. amongst a certain number of, you know, young people in, in some places, particularly in colleges and so on, I think there is kind of revived interest. I think the marriage referendum in particular and the more recent referendum has politicised a lot of young people. But, I mean, to answer your question, Alice, it's only, if you like, a certain sort of group of young people. There are a lot of young people out there who have, you know, have absolutely no idea what's going on in the political world. And I suppose it is in the, in the schools. Uh, and you talked earlier about a lot of ministers for education having been women. But having talked to those, and I was one of them myself, I think we all made the effort to go into the schools, maybe more so than the men minister for, ministers for education. I, I was chatting to a few of them lately when we had a photograph of all the former women ministers. And um, I think each of the women who was a minister for education really prioritised going to schools, talking to, to young people, and particularly encouraging young women to, um, to actually engage in politics. I know any time I ever went into a school, I always said to them, look, I hope you know, you'll, you'll vote, I hope you'll take an interest, and you, know, you can be, at the time we had women presidents for a period of time, you can be, you, know, you can aspire to that. But um, it, is, you know, it is a challenge, and it is, it is something that is worrying, but I think the only thing we can do is to, to talk about it, is to engage them wherever we can. And, um, but, you know, it, it is a situation as is. Mm. Mm. No, I mean, I would agree uh, with Jan because I think it's very difficult nowadays to get young people to be really interested in sort of the kind of politics that I certainly grew up with mm. or that Jan would, would have grown up with. They're interested in other things. So I think you have to, if you're going to appeal to them, you do what Jan said, which is go into colleges, go into second level schools, talk to them about what you can do, how they could get involved, and so on. But politics is very tough, and it's getting tougher, and more. Di I think it's much more difficult now than it was, for example, when I was in politics. Mm. I think if uh, somebody uh, like Eamon O'Keeve or Hildegard Nocton or Sean Kine goes out now to a function in the constituency, the likelihood is that if they have a glass of wine, it will appear on Twitter. Uh, within a half an hour, this is your local TD, there'll be a photograph and a little video and so on. And that's off-putting for young people because I think a lot of young people, they want to live their lives, they want to be um, free to do things, they want to um, uh, sort of examine things and they are interested. When there's an issue that they are passionate about, like the ref recent referenda, mm. then you'll get them out and then you'll get them involved. How do you continue that? I think maybe public meetings, which are not for one party or the other, but where people are genuinely invited to come in and discuss things. When I was in politics at the beginning, you, you used to be invited, or we used to be invited to um, NUIG or UCG, as it was in those days, to the Lit and Deb, uh, to uh, public meetings inside that were very difficult and very, very tough. Uh, but there was a big, strong students' union here at the time, and. Uh, you know, people from the Students' Union have gone on to don't do very well in politics. Eamon Gilmore would be one, Pat Rabbit would mm. be another, for okay. example. Um, so I think there is an opportunity, Alice, but again, it's about harnessing that wonderful amount of um, excitement and enthusiasm that was there during the referenda and to try and bring <coughs> that enthusiasm into politics, and it, that is more difficult. And m interestingly, many people are, uh, are telling me from some of the main parties that young men are coming forward and they're showing ambition and interest in politics, but it's harder to attract young women mm -hmm. into parties. And that is sad in itself, particularly 
given the mobilisation of young people in terms of the last two referendums in particular and the high turnout and we all saw the pictures of young people coming home irrespective of their views they wanted to cast their ballots so it'll be very interesting to see if that translates into I suppose normal politics the last time round, the next time round but also to make voting easier when you're holding the referendums you know in terms of what day of the week in terms of getting access to vote but there is a job to be done to make it more attractive to, to, to men and young men and women. I don't think they necessarily like what they see sometimes coming out of the doll chamber. I don't think it's attractive for a lot of people. The argy bargy, <laughs> I think they're beyond that. And I think you're going to have to try to make it more attractive. But it matters how they vote. Mm -hmm. But it was ever thus. And on that happy note, on behalf of <laughs> Katrina Crow, who curates these fantastic talks, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and for being such a, an engaged audience. I'd like to thank Martina for writing this yes. cracking book. Yes. And you'll be signing copies later, no doubt. <laughs> and also for the wonderful stories from Jan and Maura of what life is like in the bear pit. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you.